Hola, hola, buenos dias, and welcome to Chile's Coquimbo region. I'm around 10 kilometers from the coast at 300 meters in elevation. And we're in the month of July here, so right in the middle of the austral winter. And around about one month ago, 12 millimeters or half an inch of rain fell on this habitat. And while it's not much, it's enough to wake up most of the perennial plants in the area. And a really good example of one of those is uh, Oxalis gigantea. You can see the classic uh, Oxalis flowers and leaves there. And I've also counted around uh, seven or eight different species of lichen growing on this one plant. And a lot of them are probably uh, Usnea or Indigeria species. I know that red one is definitely a species of Usnea I've seen up in the Antofagasta region. I'll have to take some macro shots and send them to Patrick Young for ID. And over on this one here, we've got a, a really big species of lichen, and it's probably a, a species of Pentagenella, also quite common up in uh, the Atacama and Antofagasta regions. And of course, uh, Oxalis gigantea, as the name indicates, uh, it's the biggest species of uh, Oxalis. And when it's dormant, you wouldn't think it belongs in that genus at all until you see those uh, classic uh, flowers and leaves. And the taller columna cacti in the habitat are uh, Eulichnia acida. And they're really common in the Coquimbo region. And if you get up into the Andes, they form really, really dense forests. I'm also looking for a smaller species of Eriosice in this area. So we're going to head up a little bit higher and see if we can find it. Okay, so I've climbed up only about 50 meters in elevation. But you notice that we've got a slight change in the topography in this habitat here. So in amongst this granitic, rhyolitic, rocky terrace, we've actually got Eriosai subgibosa subspecies Negri Horida occurring. It's got these really nice, vibrant pink flowers on it. And if you look down into the throat or the tube of the flower, it's contrasted with light yellow creamy color so these cacti are able to germinate and establish themselves in this more xeric terrain because there's less competition from other larger shrubs and flora which is blocking the light in other parts of this habitat Flowers are slightly zygomorphic and probably hummingbird pollinated, but I've also noticed finches and other insects occurring in the area too. There's actually quite a lot of plants and some of them are really well camouflaged. If it wasn't for the, the flowers with this plant, for example, you could easily walk right past it and not even see it. Let's see if we can find some more. I've just noticed this little Eulichnia acida here. And this guy's only a couple of inches tall. It's pretty common in these more central regions of Chile to see cacti regenerating. Uh, but in the north it's, uh, it's less common because uh, it's much drier and, and getting dry with uh, the current uh, climate change that we're experiencing. Actually, I've just noticed uh, another species of Oxalis growing underneath this Gigantea and Eulichnia. And it looks like uh, Oxalis megalorisa. It's pretty common through this central zone. I 
actually I've just noticed uh, Tristrix Phyllis on that big Eulichnia there, we'll go and check it out. So there's actually quite a lot of the mistletoe and hollow parasite Tristrix Phyllis on this Eulichnia here. And you can see the really nice flowers it produces there. Hummingbird pollinated too. And so what we can see here is just the flower which is emerging from the cactus. So this is a pretty special little plant. It's actually one of the most reduced seed plants known in the world. So all that exists is uh, just a flower and a hostorial system inside of the cactus and that's it. So it's not a hemiparasite, it doesn't produce any leaves or photosynthesize by itself. It's completely dependent on the cactus to uh, receive all of its nutrients from. They begin to flower right at the end of summer and uh, go all the way through autumn and winter. So we've got quite a lot of nice berries forming here which is its uh, form of reproduction. So if we actually get a nice ripe one there you'll be able to see it, that's the berry if we break it open it's actually full of uh, kind of like a mucilage I guess so it's really quite sticky and so you got that nice white seed there so all that needs to happen is for that to uh, break open and fall down the cactus and that mucilage is actually going to help stick it to the cactus or you know if a bird actually eats it um, and happens to drop it on one of the areoles of the cactus just like that when it germinates, it's going to uh, send its uh, holobont and hostorial system right uh, through that cortex and reach the uh, vascular cambium of the tissue. So they've actually got a really specialized uh, holobont. It's really narrow and sharp, kind of just like the, the spine of a cactus. So it's uh, going to penetrate that really leathery skin or get through those uh, thick trichomes on the areole and go all the way through that really, really um, thick and deep cortex of the cactus. To the vascular cambium right in the center. So cacti in general are pretty resistant to uh, parasites and mistletoes but uh, that really specialized holobont is what gives this uh, tristric success. And it can also be really opportunistic and actually um, attack one of those or break into one of those damaged parts of the uh, the cuticle or epidermis of the cactus too. It doesn't have to be an areole. This mistletoe was originally thought to just uh, infect uh, Trichocereus chiloensis, but I've seen it growing on quite a lot of different uh, Eulichnia, also some uh, Chilean apontioids and maybe even a Copiapoa once or twice, which is really quite rare. Quite a lot of that Oxalis megalorisa growing underneath this Eulichnia too. And you'd almost class it as a pachyform succulent, that really thick perennial stem there. I wouldn't class it as a geophyte like so many of the other Oxalis species. That classic shamrock leaf. see what else we can find. Here we've got a really nice uh, big Puya. Can't tell if it's uh, Puya chilensis or Puya bretoniana. Puya bretoniana has a really nice uh, kind of blue purple flower whereas uh, Puya chilensis has a, a really nice yellow flower but I'm still uh, too early for those. Such a nice landscape plant. Check out those spines. If anyone's ever been hooked up in one of these, I can empathize with you, I have as well. And it ain't much fun.
Here we've got a really good example of Oxalis gigantea as a nurse plant. We've got this uh, Eulichnia and Eriocyce growing directly underneath it. So when I refer to it as a nurse plant, what I mean is uh, when a bird eats the fruits and seeds of a cactus and come and lands on this Oxalis, it's going to uh, drop them down directly underneath the plant and give these uh, seedlings a really good chance at survival. So it's going to protect them through their first few vulnerable years while they get established. So any herbivores in the area are going to uh, take the game trails and walk around these larger plants and then therefore they won't crush the, the seedlings and they're also going to get some more shade and protection while they're developing. And that's really quite a, a tall area size. It's uh, almost a couple of feet tall. And you might think, well, how old is that Oxalis? Well, from what I've seen, they grow incredibly slowly. So they really only produce just a few leaves off each shoot there. And it's only on really wet years where they extend that uh, main stem, or that main branch out. That's a really slow growing plant. It would uh, be decades and decades old. Yeah, well, so indeed with these two cacti. And actually, I've just noticed around the back of this Eulichnia here, we've got a, a nice little area size little juvenile plant, but this uh, also could quite easily be, uh, I don't know, it could easily be six or seven years old, maybe even more, depending on the rainfall. Had some quite wet years in uh, 2015 and 2017. It's the year 2021 now, so it could have uh, actually germinated in, in 2015 perhaps. gonna start making my way down. I had to stop and check out these new leaves coming out of this puya. You gotta love how they're so wavy. Also like to see uh, the impressions of the spines on the uh, Add axial or lower side of the leaves there. You also get the same thing happen, happening in uh, agaves as well. Botanical art. Well, I'm going to head into a different uh, valley area and see if I can find uh, another species of Eriosyce. Okay, so here we've got a cactus that I've been searching for for quite a while and this is Iriosize subcubosa, subspecies clavata. And while the rest of the subcubosa complex is, is really quite common along the coast, this subspecies is, is very endangered actually and it only occurs in a really small distribution zone uh, a little bit further inland. And so the major impacts are over collecting, but also the expansion of civilization. So because they like to grow on these really inclined uh, cliff faces, what's happening is uh, vineyards are being built and um, highways are being expanded. And so what they're doing is actually chipping away at these uh, rocky cliff faces to expand parts of the valley. And this is the only habitat where this specific cactus grows and so I'm lucky enough to actually catch it in flower today. I'm going to see if I can get a bit of a closer look at it. I've climbed up this really sketchy slope here. Luckily I've got a, a Eulichnia here and a Trichosirius down there to, to break my fall. Let's, uh, let's go and see if we can get a bit closer to one. Okay so I've managed to get closer to one here. You can see that really nice zygomorphic flower there. So historically any of the subcubosa complex or any ureocyce with a zygomorphic flower was uh, placed in the genus Neoporteria. 
But after phylogenetic analysis, they've all been placed uh, in the genus Eriosyce. Originally described in the year 1900 as Echinocactus clavatus. And these are super endangered. They only grow in these kind of really old rocky crevices and it's got to be really inclined. As soon as you go higher up and it flattens out, they, they just don't grow. They've got such a specific niche habitat. And so when the area is developing, when highways and roads are being built, all of that, uh, that habitat gets destroyed. And of course, another major problem is over collecting. So not too far from here where Fred Cadman was doing his studies. I think it was in 1977 uh, when he first arrived at that particular location. There used to be hundreds of plants, but now only 5% of that population remains. And that's uh, purely due to over collecting. Right up on that sketchy ledge there, we've got a group of Eriosus clavata. And some of them must be getting close to one metre tall. So the interesting thing about this species is that it never seems to actually branch. It just keeps on growing up and up. Let's see what else we can find. Here's a really good example of how crucial habitat has been destroyed. So the naturally forming vertical faces of this mountain here have been completely blasted away. So when they've destroyed that, they've actually taken those areosites with them and now the habitat and the plants no longer exist. So the chances of that species recolonizing this habitat, considering that it's already incredibly endangered, is, uh, is really slim. Okay, so I've dropped down to the coast now and it's also a very different climate here. Further inland in the valley it was 23 degrees Celsius but uh, down here it's only uh, 11 degrees so it's really quite cool and of course with a different climate you get a different type of uh, flora appearing too. And here we've got a nice species of fuchsia, fuchsia lysioides. I've actually been looking for this for quite a while so it doesn't appear to be too common but it's also uh, got a very restricted habitat it only grows uh, up to about 100 meters in elevation directly along the coast so it's quite a salt tolerant plant as well but also probably haven't been here in the right uh, season to notice its flowers before it's also covered in lichen as well Yeah, we've got a couple of different species of uh, cactus along the coast here too. These appear to be uh, Eulichnia acida, but we've also got Trichocereus species in the area too. And over here on this Eulichnia, I've noticed we've got a species of Diplolopus Borhaviifolia in the uh, Apocynaceae family. And it's even in bloom. And this is not a common plant family here in Chile. Uh, it occurs much more frequently in the subtropics and uh, in dry areas of Africa and Madagascar. And it's actually using this Eulichnia as kind of like a trellis. So it's completely covering the plant. And that's also going to help it to uh, collect fog and moisture from the atmosphere. I don't know if you can see, but the leaves are actually quite succulent. So I've got one here and it's, uh, it's about two millimeters uh, thick. So it's, uh, it's really quite succulent and it's going to help it to uh, store moisture. It kind of reminds of Hoya actually and of course uh, in the same plant family too. And we've got it uh, also growing on this Trichocereus here as well.
Yeah, it's really quite a nice plant. I'm not sure if it's so common in cultivation. That fog's really coming quite thick. I'm going to take a walk up into the coastal hills and see what else we can find growing up in there. Here we go, we've got a uh, Trigocereus nigripillus. And it's actually looking quite a lot like Sternocereus aruca from Baja California up in the Northern Hemisphere. It's got that same decumbent growth habit just sprawling along the ground there. Still too early for flowers. And it's also uh, got the parasite Tristrixophilus. We've just got a couple of flowers left. They're forming a lot of uh, a lot of the berries now. Just getting to the end of the flowering season. Have to come back in summer to see the flowers on the Trichocereus. Pretty sure that most of these Eulichnia are just a coastal form of Eulichnia acida. But uh, Eulichnia breviflora can also grow in this habitat or maybe just a little further north of here. This actually looks like a piece that's broken off of another plant and has actually uh, sent some roots down into the ground there. Okay, let's go up a little bit higher. Here we've got a really nice patch of uh, Heliotropium, Baraginaceae. Pretty sure it's uh, Heliotropium stenophyllum. That is a massive oxalis. Well, I think that's about it for me today. I'm going to start making my way back to the car. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll attach uh, the photos of the day at the end.